Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today to moderate the discussion and to, to make sure that we're running on time and getting things moving. Uh, I'm just going to give a little introduction about myself. Um, so my name is Tabitha Rodriguez. I do a lot of social justice and community work. I have a nonprofit organization called Girls Achieving, and that stands for the Gathering of Independent Resources for Living Successfully. Uh, it's a 501c3 located in Bronx, and we work with young women and girls uh, who are facing issues of inequality, poverty, and we try to help them find resources to empower them. I also do other work <laughs> uh, with youth and communities and doing uh, work with, uh, I do a lot of things. <laughs> so, today we're going to work with an amazing panel uh, who's also doing a lot of work in social justice and in reaching communities. And so, and before I get started, as we talk about language, so this morning I got up late and I was thinking, oh my God, Isaac is going to kill me. And so I'm nervous and I'm like, this is how we start, right? I'm the first person. And as I'm getting ready in the mirror, I'm thinking like, how am I going to get the audience engaged? And I'm doing my makeup super fast and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'll just be like, um, I have to keep the time, right? And so I'm like, yeah, you know, it'll be like a timekeeper or the gatekeeper. And then I froze. Because a gatekeeper to me is not the same as a gatekeeper to someone else when we think about language. And so with that, uh, we're going to introduce our panelists so we can bring them on board. So Corey Green is come on up. Corey Green? Christiana Gregori is a research scholar and founder of the Roma People's Project at Columbia University, which spotlights Roma peoples and expands Roma studies by examining topics such as identity and stigma, mobility and displacement, and archival research and digital scholarship. Herself a Roma, a member of Europe's largest minority, she has first-hand experience internalizing stigma and concealing one ethnicity. Well, hello, Corey. Come on up. <laughs> Sir, hello. Hello, Corey. Hello, Corey. That's my name. Please. A round of applause for everyone here, for all the work that they're doing, and for everyone who has come out to join us. So, Corey Green, is the co-founder, board member, and healing justice organizer who came to HALA, H-O-L-L-A, and we'll get back, and we'll get into that shortly, uh, because he needed to gain the courage to love himself and others in a way that works to dismantle the systems of oppression. Uh, Christine Lakata. She is the executive director and no longer. Please give it up for our panelists here. Yes. She's the executive director and no longer entity. She has served as a director of the community and public programs at the Bronx Museum, director of performing and visual arts for Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education. Associate Director of Visual Arts at the Boston Center for the Arts and Associate Curator at Tola Boricua Galleries in Spanish Harlem. <laughs> and so. So thank you guys for being here coming to share your knowledge, we greatly appreciate you. And so, 
I will, I'm thinking of what language means, right? I will give you a couple of minutes to give a brief description of yourself, more than what I just said, and then we're going to jump right in into the questions so that we can have enough time for Q&A with the audience, okay? So we're going to start with Christiana. So just so you know, I will be keeping some time on this. So you have two minutes to please give us some insight on what you do. Yeah, man, what I do now, man, um, I, I work with an um, organization 
that focus on Heaven Center Youth Organizing um, and work with young people um, who come from neighborhoods heavily impacted by incarceration. And we think about the government and organizing that center is healing um, and it, um, that's really responding to a lot of things that incarceration um, and the things that link with the language um, that's attached to incarceration that dehumanize um, individuals and communities. How do we help them? And I'll share more about the little pieces of some of that stuff later on. Thank you very much. Something that 
that we was talking about yesterday too, when we was building, like how it's connected to something um, deeper too that's that's internal. Um, and if, if if connected to that, it can lead to different kinds of actions and transformations as well. Thank you. Two examples in my work. Um, one uh, 
not so pleasant and not very pleasant. Um, I was in a position uh, about a year ago to turn down um, a collaboration because the, the tone of voice of the person was very condescending. Uh, she was uh, someone in a position to help us with some resources, but it was very looking down at us, and um, it was not in direct way, it's in a nuanced way, and I don't want to bring that um, energy and that kind of way of looking at us because we want equal relationships, and that also starts with um, how we look at it. And it was. It was hard because when you start a new project, you, you want the support, you want the resources, whether it's financial or in kind, but you need to pay attention to the price you pay for it. So, um, so yeah, language made, made me make a, a decision and I don't regret it, even if it made things harder uh, in some ways, um, but better in the long term. And um, a very positive example, I, um, we had a collaboration, uh, we had an event with the Flanders House at the Belgian Council last year, uh, the Journalism School of Columbia. Um, and it was, very, it was very good. And everyone who works there, um, they're um, the, the best example of diplomacy. Um, when we met for the first time to discuss, they always use uh, Roma and Romani. And you know, here we are at uh, the meeting in the New York building, watching over Manhattan, and having this discussion where you acknowledge it. Uh, and it's, it's what it should be normal, but it's not really normal when you are part of a stigmatized group and minority. Um, so that set up the tone of the collaboration. And later I spoke with somebody, uh, it's, um, uh, basically who's dealing with the management about some administrative things uh, here there. And the way she was talking and the way she was dealing with the last check was so beautiful and kind and uh, I was mesmerized by the way she spoke. And I was like, I want to meet this person. I want to do more events with them. And um, you know, my colleagues and I were like, we would like to learn from her and invite her to lunch and we connected and then we organized more events and that fostered the collaboration we have. So I'll um, just give you a couple of examples uh, more in the, you know, running an organization, running a project and uh, how a language fosters uh, different kind of relationships that um, influence the decisions we make, uh, whether to continue collaboration or Stop that, stop that collaboration. The question is, how does language, how does language love? Hello? Yeah. How does language impact the relationship with yourself and the relationship with your As far as like traumas and it comes to the healing process, using language that expresses You have to keep the mic to your mouth, you can't. Using language you. that expresses love sets the foundation within yourself to broaden out to the larger picture with clarity and understanding, right? So with this being said, how does language impact the relationships you forge, not only with yourself, but with people? I think um, I'm gonna just splatter stuff. I don't know if I can answer anything. I'm just gonna splatter stuff. I think um, like language definitely comes from the heart and comes from the spirit. Um, that like before words are spoken outwardly, that there's an inner voice that gives permission to those words. Um, and then um, just to think about like the individual and like you. Like I remember me personally. Um, I don't know what grade I was in, but definitely before seventh grade down, I would say, um, like, I definitely wasn't trying to be happy. Like, I can remember definitely having a couple of fights in like third or fourth grade when somebody called me out um, or made fun of me, like, like I was like that. And that, um, that's just one example to kind of say that, like, um, um, I felt, today I felt really connected to being African. Um, in that moment there, um, like, like that language telling me I'm that and being connected to that, like, like it stopped me from seeing like who else I was, um, who else I could be. Also, um, so that's one example. Um, another.
another example, I really was deeply engaged in like being on the block and, and being a black person. Um, and I didn't really see my life outside of being a black person. Like right now I'm in a PhD program. I'm a co-founder of Howl Up. You know, um, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Um, and even being a father, I'm definitely a husband. Um, but like none of these kind of like ideas or like concepts, like these things weren't like really attached to my spirit. Like I didn't really think I could be those things. Like and, and those things kind of like limit, like those things kept me in a certain kind of like identity mind frame when I was on the block, like what my possibilities was or how I had to like move my life who I was living for or what, or what I was connected to or who lived before me. Um, and as I went through my journey, my process individually in prison, um, outside of prison, my family, uh, with the people in prison that taught me, um, with um, my young people that I've been building with, who've been like just you know grinding with us the last couple of years, um, and just reflecting and reflecting on the process, um, like I can think back like damn, like how like how much of like how language and how I was not trying to be attached to certain labels or language. Um, how much it limited me and how much it put me in certain kind of places. And I think that is also connected to like how I talk to people in my interpersonal relationships, um, how I receive stuff from my from my interpersonal world, from the neighborhoods, like what I, you know, those things gave me instructions or like, or like what's the code of communication, um, gave me access to what language I had and what, what frameworks of language I can use. And as I moved to school to organize and I got, I got exposed to different communities, different frameworks and stuff, and these things gave me different access to, to language and how I could connect to language and how I connect to that. It gave me more ideas and perspectives to kind of like, to kind of like understand how to ground me um, as I ground with other folks, as I engage with other folks. Um, so I still have to say, like, um, the last thing I would say is that, um, yeah, that I think, um, you know, I don't know if there's an easy way to say it because the process is deep and it's different for everybody and it's a journey that's long. And I don't think like a bullet point, a bullet point could, could sum it up. But um, So maybe my last question will be, um, 
because I know we're getting to that time, but I think we make an opportunity for one or two questions. And so, in thinking, um, say you got it? If you got to say it, say it. You got to say it, say it. All I can say that um, part of what I was trying to map out to is that I started in a certain place and through my own personal journey of what the codes and the language I was given, I had to go through my own process of, of going through my own journey of healing and that healing process started giving my, myself different kind of conversations. And when I started to have different kinds of conversations with myself, um, I started to see myself, I started to see myself different and that led to how I'd be able to like connect to being a father differently, connect to being a husband differently, accept that like I'm a co-founder of Holland, that I'm not like all the things that I used to be. And I think for all of us, um, depending on what part of the world and how we was developed and who history we connected to, um, we got a responsibility to kind of like figure out like what's our journey um, to figure out how the language um, has impacted us in a way that we have to like on our own journey to know we are connect the folks. Thank you. Um, and so, in thinking, uh, in this question that I put together, uh, and I know I've had separate conversations with you guys, and some of the work that I do, uh, you know, with youth, is trauma-informed care practices, right? And, you know, recognizing needs and how to express certain words. That, you know, unfulfilled needs, needs that you have, being disconnected from your communities and things of that nature, right? So with that being said, how do we stop using language and labeling as a weapon to incarcerate and cause violence and instead use language as a tool to educate Oops, sorry. And provide clarity and understanding to those ha who have those misconceptions of people who have been incarcerated or who have been involved in the criminal justice system. I think, um, you know, right? I think, um, yeah, man, I think language is deep. And language is really, really, really deep, and it's really emotional. It's really, you know, people gotta wanna, 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 wanna meet you somewhere, wanna grow with that. And you gotta wipe your heart. I remember when I first started, started saying the N word and the B word, um, and I was older. I was like 24, 23. I was in prison. He's in Oldsville, um, and it was a thing to be like, yo, we're not saying that no more. And it wasn't also really knocking folks who were still saying it. It was just saying, like, for us, it wasn't saying it. Well, sometimes it would slip out. And, like, one of my people would check us. A young who's saying that was good. Um, and, and we had to bring it back and even think about that. So I think um, I think part of it is, is that, um, is that um, yeah, you, you, you got to be journey with other folks that's going to that's gonna love you in a, in, a, in a certain kind of way that's going to help you grow. Um, you got to Yo, and you gotta figure out, and, and, and that's part of the journey because like, like I'm still learning, I think we still, in my, all of us are still in our process. I don't even know all the languages that box people in yet, you know? And I think, um, like, yeah, like when I was like 19, 20, I definitely, and I was gonna stop the first every day, I didn't know about mass incarceration. I wasn't thinking about Jim Crow. Um, but I was definitely boxed in a lot of that. Um, I wasn't really thinking about sexism and patriarchy. I was definitely living out that every day and boxed in that. Um, so I think like as you journey, part of the journey in is, is is getting education um, and building with people that hold you accountable. You get education, you grow, you build it. Um, and those things help you understand, like you know, you know, it's, we talk about this concept called 360, which gives you kind of like this kind of like emotional, like like analysis and understanding of the experiences from different angles. And part of who we are, while it's dope and while it's deep, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of times it's only a slice of a lot of, of, of an angle, of something else. Um, so I think part of the thing is um, like getting out of our comfort zones. A lot of us who are on the block, we just stay in the block. 
know what I'm saying? A lot we think of always on that. A lot of us who are like in schools and stuff, we be in we be in conferences or we be in classrooms or we be talking to students. Um, and I think, you know, and I think a lot of people who are class, they be in places with, with people who are class right. And a lot of so I think there's a lot of people who are queer and trans, even you know, if even they black up like they be more in a queer and trans space, not even so I think the more we figure out how to connect with folks, and that's the responsibility of learning who you are to connect with folks and start building gaps and, 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 and bridging, you learn um, language and ideas and how people are journeying for survival and for victory, and that becomes your journey and survival for victory too. Um, but that got to be something people want in their heart and want in their spirit, um, so I would deal with that. Great, thank you for that. My experience is not directly with the judicial system, um, but that being said, um, we do focus a lot on our homeless project on criminalized identities and uh, uh, invisible prisons, uh, psychological imprisonment um, that um, people, Roma, and not only other stigmatized groups, uh, face um, beyond the prison system and all, all the dynamics um, there. Um, so for example, um, for a Roma child that is born to the world, uh, being labeled as gypsy comes with uh, very criminal, criminal images and uh, associations and narratives. So um, whether, uh, you know, in this case, because this is what I'm more familiar with, um, Roma people deal with the judicial system or are suspected or condemned of a crime or not, um, oftentimes they uh, are suspected as ones, uh, accused of ones, scapegoated as such, or uh, end up seeing themselves as, as so, as it was the case, uh, my case, for a long time. Um, I uh, was um, always afraid I would be seen as a worthy, as a thief, as a criminal which led me to not speak about my own identity for a long time. And it was an incident that um, uh, it was a, a sum of money that was missing that triggered my coming out moment. I was never accused of stealing, but the thought of that being the case made uh, me react very strongly and um, ultimately share my story because my reaction didn't make any sense uh, uh, in that particular moment. And um, my family, we always talked about how we define ourselves as uh, in opposition with the images about the Roma. So for a long time, I was uh, afraid of being seen as a criminal, but I was uh, glad that I was not involved with that. Well, when I came to the Center for Justice, that was an eye-opening experience for me. The Roma People's Project is under the umbrella Center for Justice. And I, when I met my amazing colleagues and um, you know, formerly incarcerated people, um, I understood the blind spots I had about that and the, the humanity and how many many of them are stuck in you know cycles of um, just you know making maybe a mistake when they're very young and being held accountable for the rest of their lives for for that. And uh, I think I mean, like identities, the difficulties with it is that it goes way beyond um, pain for a particular, um, I don't know, uh, act, uh, one, uh, a deed, and it's a label that stays with you for, for the rest of your life, and I think that needs to be uh, challenged. Um, to sum up and summarize in the case of the Roman, I'll be very brief about it. Um, the, there are, um, multiple layers in which um, Roma people are controlled and language, stigmatized language is used um, to dehumanize the Roma. Um, it's the institutional level. I was just going, reading some documents uh, during the Holocaust um, that were framed very polite, you know, that language, the bureaucratic language where you're um, making the demand very, uh, in a very polite and formal way. But the request was to deport the Roma from uh, the Romanian space to Transnistria, to uh, the Holocaust, 
and they were called parasites. And uh, it's, that's the end of the conversation. Um, it's a way to legitimize your um, decisions. When you call somebody a, a parasite or different names, uh, you don't have the empathy and the compassion. You don't see them as humans anymore. Um, it's the interpersonal link and the interpersonal part. Uh, is a Roma or other stigmatized groups and not Roma. And the word gypsy is used oftentimes uh, as ways to deplete you from power and humanity. Um, it's the more subtle nuanced one, which is now that we are global people, we're all over the world, and um, there are different groups of Roma with many cultural differences, uh, religion, traditions, um, lifestyles, and um, I think um, what happens sometimes, I think this happens with other minorities as well, you end up uh, delegitimizing the Roma who are not like you, or the gay people who are not like expressing like you, or other groups like that. And I think that's important for us to understand and uh, diminish that or even eliminate that and to acknowledge that we are in this together even if we are different and have an inclusive way to look at each other and acknowledge our uh, differences uh, and at the same time what we have in common and work towards a common goal and uh, I think the last one which I think is very powerful and impactful and where the change can start and the transformation can um, start uh, is the personal one because I think it's the relationship you have with yourselves that also matters and oftentimes we use language to control ourselves or dehumanize ourselves especially when we come from stigmatized groups and understanding that is hard <laughs> um, and difficult and painful um, but I think um, uh, seeing it's what is in our personal closet and the skeletons there and look at it and understand it's our responsibility ultimately regardless of the social injustice that made us internalize that to uh, clean up that space and replace it with new narratives and reclaim our power and humanity um, in this way and I think Corey mentioned, uh, mentioned this as well uh, of course all the other levels are incredibly important um, but uh, I think there is a metamorphosis that needs to happen inside us as well. Thank you. I want to mention two really powerful women that uh, are brilliant thinkers and have really given me a lot of insight. And one is Piper Anderson. And she's a great poet, she's incredible. Um, she does, it's mass stories, it's uh, something, it's an initiative she started. And then when she talks about language, it's very clear, it's very straightforward of how language can either define and create growth and change and how it can actually stunt that and change it. And I think that's a very powerful way of looking at even when we say things like an inmate or someone who had been incarcerated, rather than calling them, you know, people, they're advocates, they're scholars, they're mothers, they're fathers, they're thinkers, they're artists. And, you know, one of the most terrifying and horrifying things about the penitentiary system is that it is been built on, on penance rather than growth and rather than change. And there are many, many brilliant minds. There are many young lords who are sitting in prison for their brilliance, for their philosophies, for being able to reconceptualize and restructure a society that is actually equitable and equal. And they're sitting in prison. And they are philosophers, they are geniuses. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about Sophia Dawson, who's a visual artist, and she does many of these portraits of Black Panthers and the young lords who are sitting in prison because they can change the world. Because prisons are a huge part of structural racism, of keeping thinkers and doers and civil rights leaders and in, incarcerated and away from those, away from those who need that language those stories. And I think one of the powerful things ever today is people's stories. I mean, that's how we connect. That's how we communicate. And we have incredible thinkers that are being kept from telling those stories. And Sophia's work, if you get a chance to look at it, 
She not only does, you can find her line at Sophia Dawson, she calls her, her website is I Am Like Paint, and she does not only the portraits, but years of correspondence of letters, and you see this just incredible philosophy that's coming through. So when we talk about language, and how we see someone who has been incarcerated, these are thinkers, these are philosophers, these are the, the, the next generation. I cannot tell you how many incredible youth who are on their way to scholarships, and to bright futures that will change our world and make it a better place are behind bars for a turnstile fit. So that to me says we're keeping back the power that's going to push us forward. So I think there's a lot of things that come from stories and talking about that, the language that we use in reference to those who have been incarcerated and where that's going to go. I think this is one of the most important conferences that I will probably be at um, for a very, very long time because we're talking about Things. So I'm very grateful to be here, and this is really wonderful to hear everything. Thank you. So first, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the three of you for being here because you're doing amazing, incredible work, and I appreciate your stories. And as we said, language is multifaceted, right? So. Although we do speak about being part of the criminal justice system, being incarcerated, as Christiana spoke about her story, although she has not been part of the criminal justice system, there's still a stigma that's attached, right? Be it for mental health, be it for being just part of a population, right? And so um, I'm going to throw this last question out, but we're going to open it up for Q&A so that we have some time for some questions and then we can you know, have uh, the ability for the next panel to come on. And so, of course, as we speak about youth, right, it's very important that as adults, we're doing our healing process and the youth is our future, right? And if we don't help them, how can we expect them to take care of us? Um, and so, when we think about going back to using human language, right? Um, in which we hear and understand each other's feelings. How do we go back to rebuilding our communities, right? And so, with that being said, I, Isaac, I'm gonna open it up uh, for a couple of questions and answers. Okay. So we're gonna talk and walk around so anyone who wants to look at Sure. Well, okay. Um, and because I know we're probably going to move behind schedule. All right, great. So, attack. So, anybody have any questions for our panelists? Oh, I'm gonna say, come on, y'all. We saw it a lot here. Somebody needs to ask some questions. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Thank you. Um, y'all hear me? All right. I got a question, right? Please speak into the question. I have a question. Um, how do you reach those that have been impacted non by non trauma, like stigma, and you know, like you know, things that they grew up with for the rest of their lives in the community? How do y'all approach that? How do y'all approach things like non-language, like stigma and trauma for our youth inside the community? How do y'all approach that? Basically, how do you approach, like, what are you saying? When you said non-language, you need to the body language, unspoken thing. Got it. Got it. Yeah, um, I think um I think there's like not like a blueprint answer. You know, I think um I think um yeah, but I think it's hard, it's a process, man. You gotta build trust. 
I think part of part of the things that we you know, just think about me and my hood, like think about the boulevard or the other app. It's so many stories that's passed down from generations about and so much real experience stuff happened that like some of it is bogus, but some of it is real, you know? You know? <laughs> um, so it's, it's it's like yo, and I think it's also when I think about the stuff, it's also a deep hate for blackness. Like, 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 like we somewhere in our spirit, like I'm talking about the neighbors in the hood that I come from. It's like we know that like our lives is not really that important or gonna be dispensable. And, and that like that makes it easier for us to think that other blocks and other people in those blocks are similar. We just talked about this the other day, like how many times, like we grew up when we was like in third grade, we was best friends. And then like we turned 15 and you on that side, we never talk no more. You know what I'm saying? And like, and then we turned 17, 18 to keep escalating. But I remember we was like sharing like like our lunch in fifth grade. Um and but then we see cops who chase us down every day and and we don't we run from them. We don't never know how to get that same energy that we give to the person that we once grew up with to them. And I think that's part of like that something. But anyway, I think it's about healing. It's about education. It's about building relationships. It's about finding the bridge, finding who's the bridge, and how to make those bridges connect and make people see something different. It's about creating different experiences with the same people, um, but and having different moments to learn different things about each other that's not the norm. But you got to create trust with Buddha. I think that's one way to do it. Artists show us how to see alternative, and not even alternative, other histories. There's, you know, we have a, a canon of history, we have a canon of art, but for every single one of those, there's 10 books that have not been written because they're about power and control as well. And I think we look to artists, artists like Michael Paul Brito, who really look at these same issues that you're talking about that come from that through his work. And it could be a performative piece, it could be a visual piece. It could be a piece of music, but I think artists help us unpack these things and talk about them. And it's it's really it's about learning in other stories, right? So it's other other histories, other you know. There's a Yoruban saying that until the lion gets a historian, the hunter will always be the hero. And I think that that's one of the wisest things I've ever heard because there are many lion communities that are doing incredible things. <laughs> and have incredible histories that have changed the world, that set how we see the world today. But their stories aren't told, and it comes back to stories. What's being written? Many of the cultures were speaking better oral culture, so then you get that right. What you said, community, hearing another person's story. You know, there's so much wisdom in what's been said today, because I feel like that's much of what's being left out in, in the, the history that we see, or see written, or is taught. And I think that's the, the power of arts. I think it's the power of communication and like Hyperion says the power of stories. Um, but I think unpacking that comes through interactions with artists and community leaders. And our us, you know, it's like until the line gets a historian, you know, we need more connection to our elders and our ancestors. You know, and I think that's very true. So I just want to answer that with quickly. And then I'm going to apologize. Uh, because I'm gonna step off the stage and let the panelists take control. I actually have a back to school event where I'm handing out some backpacks. So I have to run there and then come back to this. So um, just quickly, uh, again, as I, you know, uh, about a month or so ago, I I worked with this foundation called the Relationship Foundation, and we actually did a presentation at the Brooklyn DA's office. And they have this new initiative, which is amazing. And so we were talking to a couple of youth for nonviolent crimes, uh, which were like gun crimes, for instance. And so what we were talking to them again were about those trauma-informed practices. And uh, we speak about nonviolent communication. And it's about learning how to separate your feelings and know about it's not about, I feel this way because you did something. Pointing fingers. It's about learning how to accept responsibility and accountability. And so bringing people together 
and learning how to communicate effectively and understand and really listen to understand without replying and being defensive and making it a very safe space. I think once you feel that they're safe and there are more people who understand them because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're not sitting here to be like super fancy and, and high class. When they feel that, they back off. When they know that you're sitting there and you're responsive and you know what it's like and you sit there and you might come out with a term or you say something from the hood and they're like, oh, hold up, she know, she know what I'm talking about. Then they can feel that connection and then slowly but surely you build that trust. And I think that's what it is that it's about starting to get together with other communities. We can't do this alone. This is a collective effort. And I think that we have to now, we're all fighting the same fight, so why not collaborate and do it together? And so on that note, thank you everybody, you've been great. I'm going to pass this on, and I will be back soon. Thank you, Tom. Can we give it up for Tom again? Go ahead. Go ahead. In the, middle, in the middle of having something to do, she came and she stayed with us and facilitated this conversation. I just want to thank you again for that. Um, any final notes from the panelists, from the audience? Anything? I don't want to just leave a conversation open. If we run over, we run over. We actually have a question. Okay, good. So let's, let's have those questions. And then after we take these questions, we do want to move on to the presentations and other conversations as well. Hey, um, this is a question for the whole panel, actually. Um, with all these new, those new languages and new terms and how we address each other as, as people, um, I see that the youth is usually more open to, more open to new language, new new ideas, new thoughts. You have an older generation that's, you know, a little bit more hard-headed about moving forward. And, and your experience is how do y'all bridge a gap between Young people who are open to new language and a passion generation might be a little bit more closed down or harder to get the message. How do you bridge that gap? I guess I remember a conversation, talking, getting youth and seniors and elders in the same room and talking. Because once you start talking to your elders and you realize the wisdom of where they're coming from or where they're coming from, where, where their words have come from. And then I think youth can have that same platform, you know, creating an equitable platform where they can speak to. It's amazing, the transformation. But I think it comes down to something you said from minimum on both of you, it's the conversations, you know. I think some of the healing circles, um, like having frameworks and like really intentional conversations to bring people together. Yeah. Um, I think um, also having separate spaces for older people, younger people to think about what it means to come together and why people and why that gap is there, so that people can kind of like reflect in their own space even before coming together. Because I think we definitely need to be coming together, but people need to be coming together like after they get some work while they still doing work. You know, it's not really that healthy to come together if we ain't done the work. Because, like we said, we don't even know the languages that box us in or the actions or experiences that keep us. And if you ain't doing the work with your heart, your spirit to come to the circle, it's, 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 it's almost um, automatic that, that harm is going to be more distant or confusion or not clarity is going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I think um, pillar circles, political education, different kind of education in separate spaces, thinking about why we separated and kind of like use that as energy when we come together to, to build. But I think at the root of it is trust building. Um, and trust building and, um, and understanding, trying to hear why people say, I'm going to stay away. And, and, and it's open space for that. Um, and, and having space to have other conversations as well, too. In my experience, uh, young and old is not always defined by age, um, defined by uh, openness to learn and curiosity. And I met people who are older, I will still be there for you, uh, who are open to learn, and people who are younger and have rigid uh, ways of grouping the things. 
Um, I think that as a communication strategy uh, to see if it's important to you, because you also need to choose your battles and some, some things you want to, you know, just think carefully how you use your energy and time and emotions. But if it's an important uh, thing for you to sort this out, uh, is uh, try to see what's familiar to them, uh, what's the context of the images, ideas they have formed, and I, I usually reacting to this as, as pleasant it could be, as no, this is not the way it is, it's not very helpful, but acknowledge their view um, and work within that framework they already have for themselves and understand where it's coming from. Because sometimes what happens is that beyond and beneath uh, what they declare and what they say, this is this and this is like that, and they will never change, is um, their frustrations, there are some forms of pain, hostility, or their own frustrations about their own lives. You know, some things you can challenge and some things you don't. Some things, sometimes you want to have a rational conversation, give arguments, and no matter how much you do that, the, what drives that is emotion. So you need to understand that and go to that space. Sometimes it's for, for therapy, it's not necessarily for a conversation. You know, that's why I say sometimes you need to choose your battle, so I hope that helps somehow. I guess I have one more question. Yeah, we have one more question. And I also want to add a little bit, of going back to um, his question, I don't know where he went. Um, I think it's our responsibility in our community to have these conversations with our youth because, you know, when we're stigmatized in our communities, if we don't do anything, that's where the stigmatism comes in. So definitely we have to use our voice, we have to bring conversations like this to our community, absolutely. Hello guys. Um, I want to piggyback on the question that she asked, for some idea. So, Give me an example. Let's say I'm walking down the street with you, Corey, and um, you say, "Hey, I'm gonna I have to just go pick up you over at my house, and you're an adventurer." And I'm not saying anything to you, but my father never tells you I'm not comfortable with that. And you say, "Hey, what's going on? I'm sensing some some you know hesitation." And I tell you, "Well, you know what? I just don't feel comfortable because from what I heard is that." Most kids around there walk around the strap. The girls are project homes. The mothers are crackheads and the girls are not around. How are you going to address that? How are you going to convince me to trust you so that I can go with you to that neighborhood? What are you going to tell me? Anyone. And, and I'll use the words that you use. No, I'll just stay away from that. What are you going to tell me to convince me that it's not the way I've heard, that it's not all about the stereotypes, that it is maybe a safe place. What are you going to tell me to convince me otherwise? Can I just ask you a clarity? No, but so is it more about what is the, the conversation we're going to have, or what language we're going to use? Like, oh, what would... Yeah, because it's a great example, and I think it comes with where you're dealing with bias and stereotype and realities and... But what... I just, think, I think uh, what she's trying to convey is how would you, using language, convince her that it is okay to walk into this neighborhood, and she will be safe walking into the neighborhood. I think I can, I'm not a fan of this, sorry, but I you think, are now. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, these are some of the questions I get um, as a pastor who talks to people who absolutely are like, hell no, I don't, I don't believe it and I'm not going for it. Um, the first thing I would ask you is where you're getting information about the people that you're scared of. You know, um, are you getting it from direct experience from them? Uh, from them, or are you getting it from information that other people are giving you about them? And if you're getting it from information that other people are giving you about them, then I'm going to say that's the first thing that's wrong with the whole situation because you're not even willing to step into the space to learn for yourself who the people are, right? Um, if you are getting it from direct experience, then the question is a different question. It's like, no, I've been through something with these people, and there's a different type of conversation. There's a healing circle that needs to take place. You know, so I think, um, does that kind of answer? And I would definitely want to let you guys go. And I think, you know, those sorts of questions, we got to unpack those sorts of things because we, we need not convince you why you should be around people. 
right? We need not convince you why you shouldn't judge people that you don't know. We need not convince you those things because you wouldn't want people doing those things to you, and they wouldn't even be fitting for people to do that to you, and then actually expect to get the best out of you, or the best from you, right? We're not even drawing on your best potential because we're judging you based on information we don't even know to be true. Does that make sense? So, let's yeah, that's, I sat here with you and, I, and uh, um, those, those were good questions. But what I want to know is, if you are in that situation, what would each one of you do to convince me otherwise? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. I, okay. Well, I think for me, you know, to what I said earlier, conversation. It's, and you really put it beautifully. It's, I would ask, well, why? Or the same thing, like, tell me why. You know, when, why do you think that, or what's happened, or where did you hear it? Like getting a conversation going. And I don't really believe that one can, uh, I think you can ask people into your circle, into your experience, but I don't know, I'm not so convinced you can convince people, because everyone is their own individual. And I would say, well, that's not, it's not my experience, and I tell you still what my story is. And I would hope by sharing something of me, like, oh, this is my experience in this, Neighborhood, or in this place, or in this uh, you know building. This this is my experience, and then hope that you share something personally. You would say, oh, okay, well then I'm willing to take a chance and trust you. I can't make you trust me. I can't make anybody do anything. You know their decisions are from their own. But I would hope that a conversation would help that, and then being okay if you were like, no, that may have to happen again. And you brought this up too. We may have to have another conversation or another. But I would hope that sharing would. Oh, oh, oh. Um, for it's a very provoking well, question. Um, I think I would uh, first I would question myself whether I need to convince that person to to visit the neighborhood because um, pleading with them and uh, sharing with them it also can come from a position of um, less power and uh, maybe that person is not ready and it's not the right way to convince them like maybe um, I, I, I think humor in uh, being secure and confident about you know who you are the community is uh, an approach I would take more than uh, giving them a lot of arguments and giving them a lot of stories because if the question comes from like you need to convince me, I would question do I need to convince you? <laughs> you know, I, I would question that frame, framework. Um, and I, I would rather focus on um, you know when, when communities focus on themselves and self-expression and they know who they are and uh, how to express in the world. Um, others will see sooner or later, and especially those who are ready to see. And those who are not ready to see, they might question, they might look, they might have uh, different opinions, they might come around, they might not, but how much energy and power do we give to that kind of uh, people and that kind of energy, right? So I would say I have a really wonderful time here. I discover amazing people. Uh, you're welcome to join to see what we do, but if you don't want to, it's your boss. If you don't want to, yeah, it's, um, I mean, there you are like, we don't need you to validate us. We don't need, we don't need you to um, convince us we're worthy. And we do amazing things. So we're like, okay, we'll see. I think that's a good question because uh, living out like abolition, um, hidden justice, in like real moments be hard because that's like taking all these kind of like ideas and concepts that are like an emotional moment and trying to make sense of it with somebody who probably are not in the same space as you. Um, but I think like I like how how just being honest started up by talking about like. Like really, I think all of it boils down. We still want to just like it's really like one part of it is like you asking yourself. We all should be asking ourselves like who we like, what we struggle with. That's what.
it really boils down to? Like, who we want to struggle with? Like, that's outside of your question. That's another spiritual thing for all of us. Really, when we think about our blood family, like, due to the way society is structured, we most, most of us, like, feel like we gotta stay with our blood family. Like, that's my aunt, that's my cousin, I gotta be with them, no matter what. Some of us who didn't have that kind of blood family, got other kind of families, we learned that, oh, you can have tight bonds with other folks, and you start to see family outside. But for most of us, we think that, like, you know, that we got this family. Anyway, so that's one thing. Like, you gotta figure out who you wanna struggle with, um, despite, because everybody's gonna live out being human. And that's gonna be imperfect. And that's gonna splash in you at moments. It's gonna splash in you at moments at different degrees. Um, and it's up to all of us to figure out where that person's heart is at. Like, where that heart is turning into. And that's something I'm gonna struggle with. And some of us, like, stop talking to our cousins, my aunts. I know sisters, my aunts, they don't even talk to each other. Like, I ain't struggling with her no more. You know what I'm saying? So it's definitely easy to like stop struggling with somebody who's from a different project building or a different block or a professor who's got a different kind of ideas than you, a different theoretical framework. You don't have to struggle with them anymore. So all I have to say to your question directly, um, it depends on who the person is. Because that statement right there can hurt somebody. Well, they say it was me. What would you tell yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that statement you say to me, like, depending on who I am. Because when you say, I don't want to come here, like, that might be a, a message that I've heard so many times in my life that I'm nothing, that my community is nothing, that, like, that we're nothing. And probably the way that I respond to that in my life is probably about punching me in the face. That's probably like, the only way I know how. Um, but because I'm like, I just heard it in a moment. And then, me again in a different state, and Corey again, like, that's probably Corey when I was 13 through 17. Probably, probably like, like, um, like when I was like 22, 21, 25, 22, 21, I probably been like, I probably, um, I probably just looked at you crazy and, 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 and probably wouldn't give you that much energy. Probably looked at you crazy and just feel like not giving you that much energy. Because I wasn't thinking about your journey. I wasn't thinking about how you got to ask me that question. I wasn't thinking about what you what you done heard or what you done, what you or what you I just been thinking about like yo they be bugging. So I wouldn't even, I just probably I wouldn't punch you in the face though, but I wouldn't just give you no energy. You know, and then when I when I left prison, and when I was when I left prison and I had a little more capacity and a little more depth, you know, I probably would ask like yo, like myself a little more questions. And this happened because I went to NYU and NYU was right next to the lower east side. Um, but that whole place we call like East Village now. And when, when new students come to NYU, they give them an orientation, a presentation, and they tell them all the places that are safe. And all the places that are not safe is not on campus, that's the Lower East Side. And my family, my cousin is from the Lower East Side, so I used to stay many nights on campus and then walk seven blocks to the Lower East Side and go with my family. One day, one of my classmates walked with me to my husband, I mean to my cousin. Right? And similar thing happened, like that this little person that I was studying with, that, that, that was from Utah, that didn't really know about the up in the early 70s. Um, and I decided to struggle with them because I knew where their heart was at. And I was like, nah, come be with me. Like, just, we gonna chill, you good. Like, I'm, I'm from here. And I was just able to kick it, but I still have to say that happened because who I was and where I was at in that moment and what that meant. So I'm saying that statement, depending on who the people are, what's their dynamic, and where people are at in that moment, I think it go go a lot of different ways.
why doesn't this place? Let's unpack that language of why this place doesn't belong to you for, for a positive reason. Like, this is a place of learning, this is a place of growth. So it's a beautiful question on both ends. When someone is afraid to enter what they perceive to be a dangerous space, it can be many things. Sometimes academia can be a very dangerous place. And so I think that that's a really wonderful way to end this thing, and this, and this panel is from my point of view, because I think it, it says a lot about entry and access. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you so much for sticking around. Yeah, a few things. Yeah, a few things. So, um, 